In episode 4 of Galagadi Photography, I travel down the Old River Valley from Tuerefiden, 120 kilometers to Mata Mata, my favorite camp and favorite road. And uh, we've captured some nice images of the world's largest bird, the ostrich, and probably the most intelligent animal in the world, the crow. I also share some, some very interesting information and facts of Springbok, the most iconic antelope in the Galagadi and the most plentiful antelope in the Galagadi. And also capture the first rolling thunderstorms as they approach the Galagadi over the dunes. So the, the road to Matamata is quite familiar to me and it's the road that the, uh, the Alb Valley is, is my absolute um, uh, favorite place on, on this earth, especially further down where you have the camel thorns along the riverbed and within the riverbed itself. And um, what happens with the Matamata Road is Matamata Camp is one of the three old camps in the Kalari with Nosop and Tuerefiden. And that's where I met my, my uh, old friend David de Villiers, which used to be the the ranger in the northern section of Mata Mata and introduced me to, to a lot of the secrets of, of the Kalari itself. This is a Gemsbok plain and just over there is the foundation of the ranger Elias Larish, the Larishes, Stoffel Rich, their house uh, and it overlooked the Gemsbok plain over here. There's also a plaque up there for the late Professor Fritz Elof that did all the groundbreaking work on the Galagadi line and other predators. No, no very visited spot but to me probably one of the top two spots in the Kalahari because of its historical value. Hello Buki. Here at Mato Mato they got these what they call river luxury accommodation and it's it gives you that Kruger National Park sort of feeling right on the boundary of the river and it's actually fascinating to to sit out here and there's no fence you got a couple of water holes or water points in this area, but um, it is the Alp River which enters the park right over there. You can see a fence right there. There's that's the Namibian fence, the straight line, and of course the catchment comes down from that side, and it runs into water water points over there, and you can actually sit with your camera. Water over there, another water point over there, and you can sit with your camera and really enjoy and appreciate without any any real fence besides this electric fence um, between you and the and the game finished the motor motor camp we got the namibian border and the border post right here on the Mata Mata camp um, and you can come through there but you have to spend two days in the park before you go out in the southern side 
or, or, or reverse, if you come in from the southern side and you want to go into Namibia, you need to spend at least two nights in the Khalakhari. And that is um, to make sure that there's no racetrack uh, or main road atmosphere from Mata Mata to Twitter Firen, which is already a bit of a problem with uh, day visitors and people that exceed speed limits and so on. But that's just that's just life. This is Mata Mata, the old camp that I used to spend the first 10 years in probably every time just in this camp. Um, right on the southern point of the two, not the southern point, but the southern of the most of the two rivers, the Aup River, the entrance is here, and the Nossop River's entrance is further up north between here and Union's End. It's also on Mata Mata, on this road where, where um, we introduced our kids to the, to the, to the Kalari and specifically to, to behave, how to behave um, as a passenger in a photographer's vehicle. And uh, they've got many stories to tell of how they had to hold their breaths and stuff for us to before we take an image, um, we didn't have all that sophisticated pods on the on the roof on the um, on the, on the vehicles and and our bean bags were not that good. We used um, homemade stuff. The, there wasn't that accessibility to to for instance the badger bags and all of the nice things that you have and the gimbals that you have today. And uh, I think it's very important that the kids are introduced to the Kalari or wilderness areas as soon as possible, and then of course introduced. And educated because if if they just introduced um, uh, to appreciate the park uh, and see it as a, as a holiday place without explaining the res the responsibility uh, that they have to sustain this park beyond our lives, it's not going to survive. And there's something here that. It's improved over the last couple of years. This always used to be an open gate. Now it's closed and you should close it because there are many, many occasions where the lion and the leopard actually came into this open gate over here and used to roam free and, and that's what you have. You have all the staff staying in that quarters over there and of course the campsite so it's quite open. It is wilderness. So important to, to close the door after you've finished. Goodbye, Mata Mata. There we go, me and Lara with all the equipment. You're going to take this drive. This is the Alp River, the river that we just stayed on just around here and the borders there. So it runs down here. Um, and as you can see, it becomes a lush sort of horse race track all the way bends and Irika Ris camp is just around the corner, the tented uh, wilderness camp, which is probably one of the most, one of the two most popular camps in the Khalakhari. And you can see just um, a month ago it was dry over here in this riverbed it was just sand and now this very green lush grass so if you look up the riverbed this is what it looks like all the way down out to Tuerefiren It was a very nice time photographing the ostrich and its two chicks. And that's two chicks of about 13, 15 to 25 that made it. The others have been eaten up. Or maybe starved. Photographically, the ostrich 
presents a, a couple of opportunities for for world class winners in a wildlife photographic competition, um, and also some opportunities of fine art photography. I think Barry Wilkins or um, Jill Sneesby, one of the two, but I think Barry has taken a, a BBC Wildlife photographic winner of an ostrich rolling in dust with some nice backlight. And I think that was the first ostrich winner. It also presents nice opportunity of the ostrich are walking in dunes because it is, it is um, well suited for, for desert conditions for, for various reasons. Um, and over here, over two seasons, this is the images that, or this are the images that we, we got. Um, you can see in some of the images there are ostriches with 13 to 16 chicks. And some of the images you'll have um, only two chicks walking with either the male or the female. Um, the chicks are quite cute little things, so they they present itself for, for, for a different type of photographic opportunity. Around water holes, the, there is a, a lot of fighting as well, like the um, Gemsbok. And um, I, on a couple of occasions, have had some real good fights of, of male ostrich around the water holes. Quite funny creatures, and uh, it would be nice to have two ostrich males fighting very close up with, with front lighting on the dune, for instance. So that is one of the things that, that one can look forward to. One of the other opportunities, they are also present themselves quite frequently on the peaks of dunes. Uh, and the reason for that is, is they, they've got very good eyesight and what they do is, is they normally go over a dune and they just stick their heads out over the dunes within the grass to see if there are any other predators. Um, so they use their necks and their good eyesight quite well in the dunes. And therefore, on the, on the, on the peak of the dunes, um, on sunset, they create nice silhouette photos, or with a, with a sunrise or sunset, they, have, um, they, they create quite, quite good opportunities, and, and you can see them quite frequently on the peaks of dunes and sunrise and sunsets. When you see chicks um, like 13, 16 over here, you must know that, that it is most probably um, other female chicks that the one group of parents are actually looking after, and it's not quite known why, why, why they do that. But one of the things the ostriches do is, is um, the main or the female will have about 30, 30 chicks. And, um, and what happens is they lay about 13 eggs and then have a collective nest of about 30 um, eggs. But the female will instinctively know that, that which are the 11 or 13 eggs of hers. And she will give preference to that eggs and roll out you know, these ones that she, she doesn't want because she can actually uh, breed on, on about maximum 20 eggs. So 10 would be destroyed most of the times. From a photographer's point of view, the behavior I think that, that needs to be considered to try and, and prepare for, for certain images is um, most probably the highlights or, or the most visible of the behavior um, that you see is the riverbed is very lush and with the first rains it becomes the the um, most nutritious grass in the riverbed because it's very low and it's flat and it's got a lot of nutrients in. So what you have is, is when you see the male springbok lying on its own in basically a hole that it's that it's rolled in for, for quite some time, and even in the midday sun, you'll see the males lying in the riverbed, and, and three kilometers further, you'll see another male lying. That is because they are very territorial, like, like wildebeest and hartebeest, and they stake themselves a territory, and what they do is, is they wait for the females to actually walk past or walk through their territory, where they would herd them, and then keep them by force, and then, and then mate with them. During this um, season, this breeding season, what happens is they can lose up to a third of their body weight because they stay put in a specific area. They don't want to leave it because as soon as they leave it to go and feed in the dunes or elsewhere, then another male would, would, would claim his territory. So, so it takes a lot of time and, and, and they dehydrate uh, quite a lot lying in the sun. But it's also because of this this 
um, a factor that the that the springbok is on his own, that he opens himself for predation, specifically by by the cheetah, and that we are all familiar with. It is probably the best location in the world to photograph cheetah, and and most of the times, like I say, in the riverbed, the cheetah prefer the springbok. So so when they're on their own and they stake their territories and they're waiting for females, they don't have a lot of other eyes like 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 twenty or or a hundred other pairs that look out for, for predation, they are on their own. And when they're on their own, you can actually clearly see that they, they, they concentrate upriver and downriver where the females or the herds tend to migrate up and down in. So their eyes are fully set on, on the females and hoping that the females will cross their territory. And, and therefore the cheetah can run right up to them and, and also other predators, especially lion as well. So they're very good for the, for, the, for the photographer to actually photograph actually fighting springbok in the riverbed and with the light at the right place at, uh, and, and the dust around them, fast shutter speeds of 1,500 to two thousandths of a second um, is, 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 is absolute minimum. You don't need, um, you go with a, a shallow depth of field to, to blur the backgrounds and so on. So the fighting, number one, the predation by cheetah, um, and then the herding of the females and then the running of the females uh, are opportunities of, of the springbok in the riverbed itself. When, when the rain has come and it, and it becomes lush and green like, like, a, like a paradise or a garden, as you can see in the images over here, it is, it is quite interesting because now the springbok attract other predators, um, like for instance the jackal, the jackal, and the cheetah will, will love when, the, when, when it's lamb season, when it's lambing season. Then you have jackal that take a lot of um, springbok lambs. And um, what happens is if it's, if it's a very good season, a springbok is one of the, the few antelope that will that'll, that'll breed every year and sometimes twice every, uh, every 13 months if the conditions are good. But they, they are not determined by good conditions. They... they, they religiously lamb every every year irrespective of how dry it is but if it's very wet or nice lush conditions like this a springbok lamb at six months can already um, uh, mate and have its first lamb around 12 months when it's a year old so so this um, conditions where where the springbok have lamb quite a lot is actually very good for for some of the predators and bad for some but very very good photo opportunities for jackal hunting springbok, um, leopard uh, hunting springbok, jackal hunting springbok, uh, fighting of springbok, and the action of, of the males actually herding the female springbok. Traveling these corrugated roads, uh, but I, I don't know if you can hear how everything rattles. Um, and this road has most probably been graded two days ago. Um, your equipment takes a, a lot of pounding and what I do is mostly you know, the two bodies that I use are covered with the, with the long lens and then the wide angle lens. The bodies are flat on the seat covered with some cloths. Um, and and at, the, at the bottom here I'll have the smaller cameras like the GoPros and stuff on a cushioned floor, sponge cushioned floor, with um, microphones and stuff ready to use and then a camera bag right at the bottom that's flat with all the filters and stuff in. Um, you know, over here is the, the GPS, um, the microphone, the dust of suntan ocean, books, flask, another flask over there. At the back here, there's uh, two more camera bags and they are strapped with a strap over there to actually stabilize them more. In the back there's more equipment and the tripod, small mini tripod, the bag with all the charging uh, cables and stuff at the back. There's some photos right next to Lara that are framed that must go to clients on the road and these must be protected because they're going to drive in most probably thousand kilometers of of territory that look and sound like this. Uh, 
Um, let's see what the guys have got over here. There's a nice water hole, but it's normally for the bird watchers or the bird photographers because it's it's always got water in. But I think over here there's got no control valve because there's a lot of water being wasted from the water hole over here all the way through to there. So some water holes don't work and some water holes are just got too much water in. Right over there, right over there in the tree, we've got a a falcon that hunts the, the birds at the water holes and that's what most people sit and wait for the do bird photography is the action around the water holes with jackal grabbing the birds or the falcons. There he comes, I think. Crows, ravens and jays belong to the corvid family and scientists seem to believe that they understand that other birds have minds like theirs and their decisions often take into account what others might know, want or intend, according to several studies. Um, psychologists call this theory of mind and its fairly sophisticated cognitive ability that humans normally only um, work out in childhood. Crows and their fellow corvids are then social animals, much like primates, so the theory of mind probably offers significant evolutionary advantages. Now that is, that is quite clear on this footage where, the, where when I've arrived over here, Alwyn has actually captured images where the crow has worked out how to actually um, successfully hunt the namaqua pigeons and other small birds that come to frequent the water hole. And on the footage you can see how it very cleverly um, works out not to either sit too still because it's not going to get anything, but there's a, there's a fine balance between just walking slowly, so it's got a very, very calm sort of demeanor. It does not race um, from pigeon to pigeon. And what it does is that the water hole has got sort of angles. So you've got a rocky angle, a rocky angle, so that it comes. And wherever it's successful, where the, where the Namakwa dove would, would drink behind the, the rock and cement, and it will approach from here, it will grab, like for instance here, it, it grabbed the Namakwa dove on the, on the wing. Um, and it seems to be quite successful and eat quite a lot. So, so Alwyn has seen one within the same hour and I filmed one that was just missed within the hour. So I, I, I think they must, they must get about five to ten of these birds in one, one sitting. But here it's clear how, how they walk around. Now if you know this, um, I, I, don't, I don't know whether, how long Alwyn has sat before she, she captured the image. But if you know this, it's, it's quite... It's quite a nice image, especially where the Lana falcon takes the, the Namakwa pigeon from, from the mouth of the crow. But the crows are very intelligent, like we've seen. They, they reckon that it could be the most intelligent animal on, on, the, on the planet and even rival those of, of primates. They're very successful on the ground, as you can see over here. They, for some reason, for years I've, I've watched them, they make various noises. Um, and, and they would they would patrol under the trees or even out in the open and um, they would feel either the vibration or they would see with their eyes whether there's the slight movement of sand that will indicate that there's there's a worm or a sand tampon or, or, or a frog or something underneath the sand and and it's and it's very successful I mean the, if you, you they walk to a specific area they would not dig with their beaks if they don't really know that there's something there so they don't waste energy um, and destroy the beak and so on, uh, digging all the time, not kidding. They know exactly where they're going to dig and, and I think most probably 80% and more of the time they will get something. Start moving with the dust. <laughs> this is the Irikaris uh, lookout point. Uh, there's 
I don't know why it's a lookout point because you've probably got 10 degrees that you can see, but nevertheless, it's a, a turn off point to have something to eat, not get a, out of your car. But I took an image here about 20 years ago called Erika Ries of one tree and in a, a specific cloud formation that I got and I never, never got again. So, but I want to show you how unique it is. Once you take a picture, um, and that whole scenery changes and you keep that for a lifetime no one can change that no one can copy it and that's when it becomes a, a collectible and and something really special so this is this is the Erika Ries uh, lookout point and what I've done is, is I drove past the morning and as I got here as I got to about here mm. this whole horizon that you got over there had absolutely no trees on now you got massive camel thorn trees they don't really grow so fast so it, it's about 10 years 11 years um, growth of tree this but nevertheless this is Irikaris and you can go all the way up even if you want to and you get that same cloud formation which which the chances are very small you can you can never copy that copy that issue and um, or that image and it's made a magnificent color and black and white image which is uh, still selling today and one of my favorite images as you can see over now uh, or over here now. Got a honey badger that went into a right in front of us over here. Ran all the way next to us and it jumped into this hole right next to the road. Quite a frequent sighting in the past couple of weeks it looks like. There is more moist in the air this morning. This, together with the bobbing agamas, are said to ensure rains within a day or two. South Africa's rain is mostly caused by an anti-cyclone movement that carries moist air from the warm Agala Sea Current on the east coast. But the High Drakensberg and Maluti Mountains in Lesotho block most of the moist that would assist the Kalahari with much needed downpours. The leftover moist that escapes the Lesotho Mountains contributes to some showers over the South African interior. The little atmospheric moisture left is for the Kalahari. Now back in the riverbed, the massive cumulonimbus clouds around midday will definitely help Joe to see the first good downpours of the onset of the rainy season. He has to race to get to the actual spot. So do the migratory species. They are all well aware that here in the desert, the range of the rainfall could be very wide. There's clearly some rain on its way to the Kalari. After today's footy and the winds, it was very, very clear to um, anyone that know the Kilhari that there's a there's a bit of a storm coming. It usually leaves the most fantastic sunsets if there's not too much dust. Um, the problem is, is you cannot always get to the top areas to actually look at the horizon. As you can see over here, you go down. But your best vantage points are right on top and you can't get because you've got to be in the camp. So in Tuerofil there's a dune in front that you can get to the front and get um, spectacular sunrises where the sun reflects back onto the clouds with the colors. What kind of images that um, is very special in this pre-rain 
predators when the dust blows up from the river riverbeds and you got the, the animals are like a ghost ghost silhouette in them now i've just got two spring mocking from time to time you have the wind blowing the dust up but of course the raindrops are now settling the dust so that's not all that possible now the next bit shot is um, of quite a lot of rain falling on the spring mock and splashing down onto the puddles below him so if that's possible let's see Kalahari or Kalahari landscape are most probably of the most aesthetic in the whole world if you, if you can get the whole thing right, the package right, the foreground, the midground, the background and some depth in the clouds and so on. And there are some, some very nice opportunities but you're restricted in the vehicle itself. With this specific storms towards the end of, end of February, end of March, mid-March, um, I saw this rolling in and you get this rolling thunderstorms and that, that that rolls in in the afternoon and so on and you've got a choice to go to um, for for the line or the predators or, or the action or you can get a high vantage point um, there are a few vantage points if you live in the Tour de Firm or Iri Caris or the tented camp and that is that is the outlook points at Iri Caris um, or Achterloni is the other one, the closest to Tuerefiren, if you want to, to, to get up high. Um, in this instance, most of the images I got, I stayed in Irikaris, and I've moved up into the Dune Road, just opposite side of the riverbed, stayed on the, on the top side so that I can see most of the rainfall and the clouds moving down. So... All of these images that we've taken over here and some of that are composites that we'll show on the on the editing suite are from probably the most important thing in the Kalahari and that is the thunder clouds that bring the rain that actually stimulate and keep the Kalahari alive and and one cannot get all of the foreground because you can't get out of the vehicle but here we've used the the Alp river bed or the green river bed as a bit of an attraction to foreground and the lucky one is the lion that actually, while I was taking the images, that walked right up to me and drank from the pool of water in, in the road, uh, as there were not a lot of water up until then. So while I was setting up, uh, there were no other vehicles, as there were um, a, a lion pack that, that actually people were waiting to kill. But I've, I've waited and I wanted the thunderclouds and I wanted the signature, the, the, the storm, the, the lifeline of the Kalari to show this rolling clouds and the rain always in a distance in the Kalari or most of the time. And uh, while I was taking the image, this male lion came walking right up to the door and uh, gave me a fright. And while I was doing a, 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 actually a time lapse and it drank right next to me. So, so, so here's the line that we got um, that's not in that to good condition you know it's it's lived through all of the toughness of the Kalahari and it and it picked the the one pool of water in the road that it drank from right in front of me and I had of course a wide angle lens I think it was the 20 formal we'll see later on I drank in this little pool right next to the door and of course if I could get on its level with a wide angle you know but I was this is right from the window of the door but this is an image that I envisaged for quite some time as a lion drinking in the foreground and some storm clouds in the back. So this to me is an epitome of, 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 of a reflection of the toughness of, of the Kalahari lion that tried to survive in this dry desert condition and the mocking thunder clouds and rain in the backdrop. On the last night of Joe's visit to the Kalahari, Jupiter and Saturn made their rare visit to the moon. And the next morning, it was scooping up fresh hope for more rains. By midday, the cumulonimbus clouds were working hard to produce that promise. But it all fell in the far off distance.
Thank you for watching episode 4 of Khalakhari Photography. Please make sure that you don't miss episode 5 which starts concentrating on the Khalakhari line. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and please make sure that you watch the next program.